the those YouTube videos and the yeah. articles and stuff. Okay. I thought the one, the shorter one of those videos was um, pretty basic, but I thought she reviewed the concepts very, very well. Yeah. And like, it sort of like brings it home, I thought. Like, the, I what did you guys? It was like, and I'm repeating myself again. Yeah. Plus, I thought it was funny that, you know, she clearly like set up her own video and then jumped into the screen to give her a thing and stuff. It was really funny. But I think I thought she did a good job with it. And so I thought that that was like very useful information. We'll go into like a few more um, that crash medical video. I think we'll go into a few more like random cervical things and stuff. Okay. And um than what he did. But is, is it time to start? Or should we give it a few more minutes? Time to start. Okay. So um, today we're gonna be talking about the non-malignant diseases of the cervix, which is pretty much um, cervical dysplasia and a lot of other um, random things. Things you would see that may or may not be symptomatic. So um, I do have, um, my like resources upon request. I didn't make a slide with like the sources that I use to pre prepare the talk, but if you would like them, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, so I thought we would start at the beginning um, with embryonic formation of the female reproductive system. Don't worry, this is, I'm, I know you probably have a, a lecture that's more, um, or just about this specifically, but just a little bit of a reminder um, about development because some things that you will see or um, find based on symptoms will, and further evaluation will be resulting from formation of the um, female genital tract. So um, the, the female reproductive tract forms from the mullerian ducts. Do you guys remember what structures form from these? The and your cervix and the upper third of the vagina. Are yeah, fallopian tubes. Yep. So, um, and then there's, do you remember what the other name for mullerian ducts are? That you'll see sometimes it's paramesonephric ducts. And then the, for the male genital tract, do you remember what those ducts are called? Wolfian. Wolfian. Yeah, or mesonephric. So they each have two names. So, um, so the cervix, um, the development of this starts around the sixth um, week of embryologic development. If you don't have, so what happens basically is the Mullerian ducts fuse and then they canalize and then the solid component, the um, sinovaginal bulb touches up to the Mullerian ducts and then that forms a plate that then opens. And so if you don't form Mullerian ducts, if, they, if you don't get those, then you're not gonna have a cervix or uterus or fallopian tubes or upper vagina. Um, but the absence of the cervix in that way is called cervical agenesis. You can get, um, what, would a, a, um, what would a symptom be in someone presenting with um, cervical agenesis? No menses. Yeah. Painful. Um, what is it? Hematometria. Right. So if they have a uterus, like with, there's another thing called cervical atresia, which um, results from incomplete fusion of that plate. So if they have a um, uterus, but no cervix, then they'll have that, um, the cryptomenorrhea, which means there's stuff here to come out, but it doesn't come out. And so that's an absence of the, the presentation of the period, basically. So what would, so no period, abdominal pain, they might have a pelvic mass because the uterus is continuing to distend from the um, growth of the endometrium. And so I could not find a picture of what you would see on speculum exam, but if you were to imagine this, what would you, like someone comes in, presumably she's young, probably 14, you know, 13, 14, whatever. And she's having like a pelvic pain um, or abdominal pain and no period. If you 
were able to do a speculum exam, which you may or may not um, choose to do that depending on um, the clinical situation, but what would you see, do you think? I imagine just like a blind pouch mm -hmm. and then maybe like a bulging. Mm -hmm. And you'd feel a mass probably on by manual exam. What test would you get? Well, like ultrasound. Or an MRI even, because um, it might be a little bit tricky on, you know, she would have to have probably an abdominal ultrasound. And I would imagine that um, there would be some features of that that would be suboptimally visualized. Um, this is extremely rare, the cervical atresia. There's less than 100 cases in the literature. And though it might be tempting to think that you could just fix this for her by like opening this in the operating room and letting this all drain out, that there, this is a very high risk surgical procedure to fix this. And really, um, if you could refer her to some, unless you are the referral place, um, refer her to someone to do it because there's a very high rate of surgical complications like um, repeat stenosis, infection, reoperation, hysterectomy, deaths have been reported um, from this. So you do want to like, unless you're the person, refer to the person. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to talk about is you can get a double cervix, which when you look in, you see two cervices, um, and oftentimes associated with a longitudinal vaginal septum. And that results from lack of appropriate fusion of these ducts at around week nine. Just a really quick question. Yeah. With that cervical atresia, whenever they do, like at the referral center, when they are fixing it to drain it, do they like put a catheter in there or something to keep it from re like stenosing or? Yeah, they like say that you can put a, um, like a, um, like a nasogastric um, or one of those oral gastric or, or gastric tube, like one of those, or nasal, what are they called? Nasal laryngeal airways. Oh. They're like the little rubber. They're like this long and they have a hole in them. You can stick it in there and keep it in there to help keep it. Patient. Oh. What do they do for cervical agenesis? Like if there's no cervix? I, I don't, I think you're, you, I mean. You just have to do a hist, right? Like. Well, cervical agenesis is the lack of formation of all of it. So. So there's there no would, uterus either. There would be no uterus either. Okay. So there's, I mean, nothing to do um, for her there, but you give her the explanation as to why she's not having a period. Um, and then you can get a cervical, were there any other questions on that? So then another thing you could see, which I think could be easily confused with like a goober, is a cervical septum. And that you get um, as a singular muscular septum, it's an extension of a lower uterine segment septum typically. And that results from incomplete resorption back, whoops, back here like the resorption doesn't happen properly and then you the septum stays down there okay and then this is a classic question on like every test somebody has a mullerian abnormality what else do you want to investigate their kidneys mm -hmm. what percentage of, of women with mullerian problems or mullerian anomalies will have urinary tract anomalies 40 15. Exactly in between there, um, 20 to 30 percent. And they, of course, um, because they still have, they have their ovaries, typically, they would have normal secondary sex characteristics. Um, okay. Onward. What is this? The Bothian cysts. Yes. And what do they represent? Mucus. They're like glands that are plugged. Mm -hmm. Retention cysts of what kind of cells? What kind of glands? Columnar. Mm -hmm. columnar and, and what causes them to, um, like why, why does that happen? Or what's the, um, what are the cells that are? Plugging it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's at the transformation zone or the um, columnar to squamous junction. So you have the columnar cells that produce mucus and then the 
in the transformation zone, they're transitioning to squamous cells. And so they get plugged by the non-keratinizing squamous cells. And what is that called when squamous cells Meta are? Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go that was it. Uh, when columnar goes to squamous, it's called metaplasia. Yeah. Very good. And so generally when you see these, they're less than a centimeter in diameter and um, they can get bigger around the time of menstruation with an increased mucus production. Um, they are typically in the, um, like the proximal ectocervix. And um, if you see something that is lateral to that, like more out here, usually over here. Do you see my arrow? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, then you want to, and bigger, you want to think of a mesonephric cyst. I promise this is the last embryology. The, so when you have the Mullerian ducts and then the mesonephric ducts, these are the male genitalia makers. So the or male reproductive makers. So the those are supposed to get resorbed. And if they don't, they can leave cysts all along your Mullerian system. So probably the more well known is a cyst in the vagina that's a mesonephric remnant cyst. Do you guys remember what that's called? It's written right there if you can read it. So Gardner's? Uh-huh. And if they are down in the cervix, then they can be these mesonephric cysts. So think of, if you see something that's bigger than a centimeter, lateral, deep, that's, it's probably a mesonephric cyst and, and not a Nebothian cyst. And the treatment is just drainage. You just um, grasp it with a, um, like a Tischler or something and just drain it. Uh, okay. And so, um, so, you put in the speculum and what, what is this? A cervix. Cervix, good. So, so this is um, an example of, so when you go in the cervix looks a lot of different ways, right? It might be kind of pale. It might have Nebothian cysts like it did. It might have an area where it's like a little bit beefier red. And this is called, and this is an example of cervical ectopy. And if you look at the histologic term for this, if you were to biopsy it, it's, um, they use the term often has microglandular hyperplasia. And that's where the columnar cells of the, um, are like present longer on the ectocervix. So you don't see like the squamous metaplasia here really. And this is a, like a, um, like an over, an increase in endoglandular cells. And it's an exaggerated response to hormones, typically progesterone. So you can see this oftentimes in pregnancy. Um, most commonly noted in women ages 20 to 35, and it's not associated with cancer. So, but, but if you were to see this, you might think this person is um, pregnant, although the cervix doesn't really look as soft as one might expect with a pregnant cervix. And um, or like on a progesterone um, contraceptive option. Okay. Logically, that's the same as like ectropion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And what is this? Polyp. Yes. So what might she, um, well, first of all, if you're going to describe this in your note, what would you, how would you describe it? Go ahead, Brittany. Beefy red, um, I would say maybe like, yeah, pedunculated, protruding from the external os um, anteriorly um, around 12 o'clock. Um, yeah, I would measure it however big it is. Um, and yeah. what might she present with? Um, she might have like intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding. Yep. So, um, so this is um, a cervical polyp, like you said. It's probably an endocervical polyp versus an ectocervical polyp because it's beefy red in nature. The ectocervical polyps will be more like this color here. 
um, the symptoms exactly right on. What else would you think of? Are you like, this really looks like a polyp, but a if fibroid. you see something else protruding, okay, fibroid, what else? That's um, maybe an endometrial polyp. Uh huh. How about do you, um, how about our other first years? Cervical cancer. You can think of cervical cancer. That's exactly right. Um, also like retain products of conception. It doesn't look like that, but that's, I mean, it could be, or a papilloma. Um, right. So cervical polyps are caused by inflammation or they can be a, like an abnormal focal responsiveness to hormones. Um, do you need to remove this? Electively. Yeah, they're usually not worrisome, but they can cause symptoms, which if you, you want to make sure that you are not like attributing abnormal uterine bleeding to the polyp and then leave the polyp. And then she's really got something more important. In fact, do you know how many, um, like what percentage of women who have a, what percentage of asymptomatic women who have a cervical polyp will have concurrent significant endometrial pathology? It's not very many, it's 5%. But I think enough that if someone comes in with abnormal uterine bleeding and they're also at risk for endometrial pathology that they, aside from removing this polyp, you probably would wanna consider doing an endometrial biopsy or at least remove the polyp and say, if you're still having abnormal bleeding in a, you know, a couple months that to come back for a biopsy. Um, and I know that this is like super common question. You guys know this, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, who are the people that are at risk for um, endometrial pathology that have abnormal uterine bleeding? Like what are their features? OB. Um, early menarche, nulliparous, so like extra e estrogen. Yeah. So people with um, anovulatory bleeding, PCOS, or anovulation, I should say. Okay. Older and women. So, yes. So women over 40 to 40 also, you, or like pick an age. I usually go with 35. Some people go with 40, but um, you'd want to sample them. Okay, and then this is a endocervical polyp on histology. So you you might get like a, not that I'm expecting you to know what that is, but there's some features of this that if you were given this slide, you might think um, polyp. Can you guys like um, describe anything that would make you, like if you were given, here's something some clinical scenario, let's say post, post coital bleeding or something that would make you pick polyp for this versus like a prolapsing fibroid? I don't see like muscular stroma, mm -hmm. like, like muscular fibers. Um, you see more like glandular histology. Yeah. And there's this like space in the center. So fibroid would be solid. So just like a little reminder, like to use your clues when you have a you know, a test question like that. Okay, and so not that you would see this um, when you did the speculum exam, but um, what is this? Cervical fibroid? Mm-hmm. So the uterus is here, cervix here, and then this fibroid is originating out of the cervix. Um, does anybody know what percentage of fibroids are classified as cervical? I think you're, are you muted? I'm just going to guess five. Yeah, that's perfect. So it's three to five or three to eight percent. So this person, you, you know, you wouldn't see it, this fibroid coming out the cervix or anything like you would on a prolapsing fibroid, but she would have a, um, you know, a pelvic mass. You would see that on, on, um, or you would feel that on exam. How do you suppose they got this out? That's what I was wondering. 
I mean, you, so let's say, let's say you did an exam and you expected this situation. One of the third or fourth years, how would you approach this? Um, we want her to have stents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think abdominal. I mean, there's no way that I feel like you'd be able to get around like all of you to get to your vessels and everything to try to do it minimally invasive. That's what I think too. Or even like put your manipulator in and try to right. move it. How are you going to, like, is it going to move? I feel like that fibroid would take up the whole pelvis. I agree. Okay. So this is the prolapsing fibroid, presumably coming from where would you say? Endometrial cavity. Yep. Okay. And then um, another thing you might see or, or quite often find when you're trying to do a biopsy is cervical stenosis. What are the ways that you can get cervical stenosis? What are the causes? Trauma. Um, history of a procedure, like a little birth cone. Um, postmenopausal. I'm sorry? Postmenopausal. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. You can, it can also be congenital. Um, and usually if you have that, it's at the internal os. Um, but radiation, infection, atrophy. Um, Another one that I hadn't thought of before, but came across when I was preparing for this is um, endometriosis. And so and that can cause cervical stenosis. And so think about that if you have a patient who, it, who you find cervical stenosis, like let's say you're doing a biopsy in a youngish woman for abnormal uterine bleeding and you find stenosis to think about endometriosis as a potential um, cause if that's something that you're finding. So what would be the, um, the symptoms of cervical stenosis if she had any, like a premenopausal person, we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but what would, what she would could get like amenorrhea or like hematometra, like not actually letting her menses pass through. Mm -hmm. So then that could cause like abdominal pain or fullness. Yep. And it might be like infertility is the presenting sign. Again, if endometriosis is the cause of the stenosis. And what about a postmenopausal person? How would like that? Fluid in the endometrial cavity on an ultrasound. Can you say that again? Like I've seen fluid in an ultrasound on an, um, in the endometrial cavity. So sometimes it just can't get, the mucus can't get out. What's, um, so mucus and what other kind of things can ca cause fluid in the endometrial mm -hmm. Or pus. Yeah, pyometra. Um, okay. And then what's this? Cervical pregnancy, that looks terrible. Yeah, I could not find any um, actual pictures of a cervical ectopic like on speculum museum. You know, presumably because if you saw it, you would get out as fast as possible and not take a picture. But um, so what percentage of ectopics are cervical? Less than 1%. Yes. That was the only question I could find to ask about this. Okay. So um, next we're going to talk about cervicitis. Um, so yeah, what? Treatment, treatment of cervical ectopics, that's mostly... Like you try methotrexate, but if that fails, that ends up being a hysterectomy, yeah? I would think so. Um, I mean, maybe. I had one and we did high dose methotrexate with leucovorin rescue for a week. Thank God it worked. With a what for a week? High dose methotrexate with leucovorin rescue for a week. She stayed inpatient and it worked, thank God. So how did, so what were her symptoms? After, did she just, did she bleed a lot after the treatment? Did um, she just had some spotting, but yeah, we prepped her for all the hemorrhage and things that could happen. I wonder if you could do like a um, embolization type we situation and try a conservative surgery. We talked to Ankh and that was one of our next steps. 
Does anyone else have um, experience with so, cervical ectopic? I saw one when I was in Louisville and they do the methotrexate and then if that doesn't work, then they do like, if somebody still wants to retain their uterus, then they try like vasopressin and try all of these things and do an endocervical curatage, which is like really scary, but they just, you know, prepare for a hysterectomy and all of those things and try to make sure that they can reduce bleeding. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what, what prevent, um, so cervicitis is inflammation of the cervix from various causes. What um, helps protect the cervix from inflammation? Mucus. Mm -hmm. how, how does it do that? The glands, the columnar cells secrete the mucus. So there's in, in the mucus is antibodies and inflammatory cells and they're active against various STDs actually. They, um, and they may act as a competitive inhibitor with bacteria for receptors on the endocervical cells. So um, what is this? I'm sorry, it's not in focus. Purulent discharge. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you diagnose that? By looking what mountains. And what are, is there a criteria on your what mount? Like, so just by looking, this yellow mucopus. And then when you look, what, um, under the microscope, I mean, or is there a criteria? What are you looking for? You're looking for what mount? Then 28 for high power field. Of what? Uh, white blood cells. Neutrophils. White blood cells, yep. Good. What percentage of women with mucopurulent cervicitis have no identifiable pathogen? Anybody? 30%. This is 30. It's like 40 to 60. I thought it was a really high number, I, um, but it explains a lot um, to me. Okay, and so um, mucoperulent cervicitis wanna test for STDs. Um, okay, sorry, this picture's out of focus, but I think if you move away from the screen, you can see it better. It comes into focus, I've noticed. So can somebody describe what what these findings are. Like if you if you were in the room um, with just the MA doing the exam and you saw this and then you had to describe it to your attending, what would you describe Dr. Damien? Sorry. Um, I mean, from far away, I don't really see a difference, but it looks like it's red inflamed. I don't know if those are Nebothian cysts there. I can't see if anything's coming out of the cervix or not. Um. So, so Nebothian cysts, so if you're looking at these, I would say like Nebothian cysts should probably more be over here, right? Okay. So, so this would be a little in. lateral for that. And they're not, these, I mean, yeah. I have the advantage of knowing what this is, but the, um, they're, they're not very big, like to consider like a mesonephric cyst, but there is, you're right. It there's works. no mucopus here, but this is inflammation of the cervix and these, yeah, honestly, you guys can't see it better if you back up. Um, the, these are ulcerative lesions here. And so what, what causes ulcerative cervicitis without mucopus? Yes. Herpes. Okay. And what is this? How would you just, first of all, how would you describe this? Like you have to report what you saw in your note or to your attending. Course okay. eight vascular punctations. And this actually has a, um, a name that it's referred 
to or by referred to as? Does anyone know? This is called a strawberry cervix. Does anyone know what it's sort of pathognomonic for? Trichomonas. How do you treat that? Metronidazole. How do you prescribe it? Huh? Two grams of flagell PO, one time. Yep. Okay. What are, what is, what, how would you describe this? Anyone? How about, let's see, who are our second years on besides the Damien? Matthias, are you on there? I'm here too, House is here. Okay, oh, House, I haven't heard from you. What, I don't think. Um. So I would say it's hyperemic um, with multiple raised red lesions. Mm -hmm. And um, how would you describe this? That looks like some sort of melanoma. <laughs> uh, um, raised macular, I don't know. So race is red, I would, you know, it's a red spot there. So those two and this, which is in the posterior called the sac, here's your cervix. Endometriosis. Yeah, endometriosis. Okay. And then also out of focus, sorry. Um, so another thing not related to endometriosis, you might see is like a white plaque at the cervix and the, the term you use for that is leukoplakia. It's not a diagnosis, but more of like a descriptive term, but it implies either hyperkeratosis or parakeratosis. You can have it with condyloma. And I don't know if you guys can see the very top of the screen, mine is covered up by a screen sharing thing, but up here <laughs> is, um, uh, the descriptor mother of pearl, which um, they use to describe like a condyloma. Um, can you also get leukoplakia from like chronic irritation, like sometimes tampon wears? Uh-huh. Okay. It's in, it's, it's uh, the um, hyperkeratosis, the extra keratin is like a- Protective. Like a callus, sort yeah. of. Um, but you can get it with a wart too. Um, You can get it with uh, condyloma, like I said. Condyloma has a lot of different appearances. Let me just ask before I move on, if you poke this with a probe, is this gonna be like hard or soft? Hard. Yeah. If you poke cancer with a probe, it'll be soft. Just so, you know. so lots of different ways condyloma can present. Um, bulbous like this. This is with um, acetic acid and this is with Lugol solution. It can be very fine and papillary like this little bumpy stuff. It can have the marked keratinization here. It can be like even more papillary. And then there's this condylomatous cervicitis and vaginitis, or sometimes they'll call it um, colpitis. And that's with acetic acid solution. And um, can you guys see how there's like normal mucosa, but then all these little white dots on it? Um, that you might find on colposcopy. And the um, it's a variant of a flat condyloma. There's nothing to do for it, but it could explain your abnormal pap test. Okay, so well, does anyone have any questions about that stuff? I'll just move on to neoplasia. So um, cervical cancer was previously the leading cause of cancer-related deaths among women in the United States, but the um, incidence and mortality both have decreased by 70% since the 70s. 
largely due to the introduction of the PAP test in 1941. And the great thing about cervical cancer is that there is a typically a pretty long pre-treatable or treatable pre-invasive phase. And virtually all cases of cervical cancer are caused by what? HPV. Persistent high-risk HPV types. So what kind of virus is the HPV virus? Does anybody know? DNA. It's a double-stranded DNA? Yeah. Yep. And there are over 120 types identified. Does anyone know how many um, invade the genital tract? It's 40. What are the high risk types? 16, 18, 30, 31, 33, 35, 40, 41, 42, 45. There's a lot I'm missing. <laughs> so 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. And 16 and 18 are responsible for more than 70% of cervical cancers. Um, I'm presuming that that's in the United States because I think there is some regional variation to that depending on the, what country you're in. But um, they say that about 80% of women are infected with HPV at some point. So how, so 80% of women have HPV way fewer than 80% get cervical cancer. What's the, what's, how is this gonna turn out? For like, tell me how many, like what happens with an HPV infection? A lot of the time our body can clear it. Mm -hmm. um, mostly within 18 to 24 months of infection. Does anyone know how much, how, what percentage of, H, of HPV will persist and then form significant like pre-invasive disease? It's not very much, it's three to 5%. So if a patient is asking, you know, you, you do her pap and it's ask us positive HPV or something and she asks you what, you know, what's gonna happen now, you can tell her that the chance of her getting, like a, or actually having a real problem that's gonna require treatment is low, three to 5%. And then what percent will go on to get invasive cancer? Like 1%. Less than one, yeah. So um, the area of the cervix that's most susceptible to the HPV attack is the squamoclunar junction. And it's any, in, generally in the body, anywhere where metaplasia is occurring, those cells are more vulnerable. Um, again, there's other HPVs that, and other places they attack, but any place where there's squamous metapl or any metaplastic area is where it's more vulnerable. So um, HPV like gets in through some microabrasions, gets to the basal cells. They make the virus, which come out and go infect somebody else. But then they also get integrated into the host DNA. This is a reach, um, but does anyone know what tumor suppressors are inactivated that allow and RB. Um, yes. It depends on the HPV type. So tell me more, McKinsey. Strong work, everybody. Uh, uh, type 16 inactivates P53 specifically, and then 18 is the RB or retinoblastoma specifically. Excellent work. But most of the time, your the host immune system takes care of this. So whether... So you might talk about this with Dr. Dixon again in an hour, but um, what are the risk factors for cervical cancer? We won't. So this is no. what New sexual partners, high risk sexual activity, new sexual or increased sexual contacts. Yeah, immunosuppression, HIV. So yeah, so also smoking, a history of vulvar or vaginal dysplasia, um, which most people have cervical and not the other, but, um, and then um, OCP use, early age and on, 
you know, early age of onset of first sexual activity, you guys said multiple partners, history of STDs. Okay, so how, how do, what's the primary prevention for cervical cancer? So primary prevention is something that we do to prevent it from happening. Connection. Huh? Vaccine. Yes. So um, there are three types of HPV vaccines available. Do, can anyone um, talk about those? Like what, what they cover, three different kinds? Because they're different. So back when the HPV vaccine first came out, there was a bivalent called Cervarix, which covered 16 and 18. Then was the regular old Gardasil that covered 16, 18, 6 and 11. 6 and 11 cover or for wart prevention. And then the nonvalent is the one that we do now, which is the Gardasil 9, which covers which types? Like you don't have to say all nine, just throw, throw out the easy one and then you can do the harder ones. 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. It was in that video. Yes. Plus six and 11. You said six and 11? No, I did not. But yes. So, okay. And actually they're all about equally efficacious, all of the vaccine types. And probably because 16 and 18 are the main problems, but how efficacious, like you're trying to get someone's mom to give her daughter or son the vaccine. And she wants to know what, what's the chance this is gonna help my daughter, let's say from getting cervical dysplasia. What's the percentage? Almost 100% uh, preventing, um, preventing you know, cervical vulvar or vaginal disease caused by those uh, viruses. So it's 93 to 95% efficacious. And what percentage of kids in the United States get vaccinated? I know it's less than 80%, which is what we hope for by 2020. Yeah, we missed that. It's a third. A third. I was going to say we missed it by a lot. Yeah. Like, a lot. And in Canada, Australia, and the UK, it's 70%. Um, but in the United States, it's only a third. So what's secondary prevention? What do we have for secondary prevention for cervical cancer? Pap smears, so that's yes. like screening. Yes. So tell me what the, just for screening, not surveillance of a detected problem, but just for screening, what are the screening recommendations for pap smears based on age? It depends on who you ask. Okay. So tell me the- 21. Beginning at 21, you start with a pap smear every three years. And then when they hit 30, mm -hmm. you do pap smear with HPV co-testing every five years. Mm -hmm. And then unless they have an abnormality, which would alter the, um, how quickly you would bring them back. So when do you, oh, sorry. Huh? Why? I thought we now do, or it's recommended to do HPV based testing for everyone and then reflex to cytology if it's positive. So that's only if you have a, a lab test. that can do primary HPV testing. There's, it's not the same HPV test okay. approved for co-testing it is as it is for primary HPV testing. So there's actually three screening regimens that are acceptable. HPV-based testing is preferred, but that includes co-testing or um, primary HPV testing with the reflex to cytology based on that same sample. Um, PAP screening by itself without HPV testing is also still an acceptable but not preferred um, option. They say that in any instance where HPV-based testing is um, recommended. The interval is shorter for just PAP-based testing. And I'll talk about that in a little bit longer or a little bit later. I know the information that I sent out to you was the ACOG practice advisory on the new PAP recommendations. If you want more details, there's a, a really good article, 
article, an executive summary in the Journal of Lower Genital Tract Disease that you can um, find that goes into a few things. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. But the when do when do you end um, when do you end Pap screening? At, 65 if they've had regular for 10 years or normal for 10 years. 25. So, so the, right, that's age 65. Sorry, I didn't mean to be unclear by that. But they have had to have um, more definitive de definitions about if there's something abnormal, how many years thereafter do you continue? And that's where the 25 made it more clear in this new update. Yeah. So if, if a person has had only normal pap tests and they're 65, if you have three consecutive negative paps documented or two consecutive negative HPV-based tests and no history of CIN2 or more, at age 65, you can stop. But what percentage of cervical cancers occur in women over 65? Just throw out a guess. Five percent. How many? Five. It's actually twenty percent. What? And yeah. So so correct. The the other um, the caveat that I think Michelle was talking about was that if you've had CIN two or three in the last twenty five years, then you continue screening those patients. And, you know, does, in, does anyone see a problem, um, does anyone see a problem with the, the, these recommendations or concern? Does anyone have a concern about them? Cost and intervention? That's expected. Mm -hmm. Well, I think well, that right. my personal concern is that, um, you know, a person might have, like had a leap that they forgot about or had a leap for persistent CIN1, which has a different outcome, you know, expectation or risk um, profile than a CIN2 or three leap would have had. And with, um, you know, the, these recommendations were based off of um, studies at Kaiser with like one and a half million people over a decade. But Kaiser has a very, um, like succinct system in place. Like I, I believe like in their market, they're it. And so like when we have trouble even getting a pap test from Columbia St. Mary's two miles down the road, this, I really worry that people are gonna be lost and not, and even though they're coming in for their pap or their exam after their hysterectomy that they didn't realize they had CIN2 10 years ago for whatever that, that we might see an increase in cervical or vaginal cancers after hysterectomy or whatever it is, just because of the difficulty in keeping track of people. Well, for um, my, in my rec recollection of reading the position statement, they said that if you have, I, th I think it's something about how you could keep testing forever if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Say you have to stop at 65. They don't say you have to stop, you know, at these different intervals. If you wanted to and you had good idea on why you're testing, you could keep testing forever if you needed to. Mm -hmm. They don't say it's a hard stop anymore. And when the, um, but if you're, my, my experience has been that some, sometimes either patients or their providers might choose to do the lesser testing, even though, um, you know, like only get a pap test every five years means, well, okay, you only need a pelvic exam every five years too, you know, like that kind of thing. It just, it just, yeah, you can like absolutely keep going. That's how I read that too. As long as the person's life expectancy and physical um, condition didn't preclude you from doing that testing, I guess. That's how you, that's how you read it, Liz. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, exactly. So I think that covers your concern about patients who come in at the age of 68 with weird stuff happening and you're not quite sure about their background, testing them is not uncommon or unreasonable. Um, okay, so we use Sorry, the, the Bethesda, 
before huh? we leave the topic, I think it's great to test all the old people with the cervix still. But doesn't Medicare stop paying for PAPS at some point? I've never had a situation where someone said their PAP wasn't covered by their insurance. I think if you have a good enough reason, they'll cover it. And okay. you can it. The other thing with regards to screening that Dixon and I were talking about the other day is that the American Cancer Society actually now recommends starting screening at 25. And so I'm suspicious that ASCCP might be leaning towards that. Like they haven't come out with new screening recommendations. They've only come out with like new recommendations for, you know, what you do if things are like bad. And so, you know, with the app, we've all had confusion on like putting stuff in. And I think it could be because that might be in the works, but it's, you know, something that's always evolving, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And bouncing back and forth which we'll talk about in a little bit also. So what percentage of PAP tests are ASCUS PAPs? Anyone? Three to five. And then what percentage of ASCUS PAPs are ASCH PAPs? Less than one? 10. Um, five to 10. And then um, when you get an Ask H PAP, the, um, how I think of that is something like akin to high grade SIL, but maybe not as bad. And the, um, the recommendation for an Ask H PAP is to do what? Colposcopy. Yeah. And then what do you do? And I'm not gonna, I, I don't want to go into like all of the potential branches of the algorithm that's behind the scenes in the, the app, be, but I think there's some like general things you can glean from the, or guiding principles maybe from the ASCCP um, guidelines that just in general, you can have a, in mind, like their first low grade, if they're over um, a certain age, 25 or maybe it'll be later, later. Um, so if you get a low grade PAP on a patient, low grade SIL on a patient who's 29, let's say, um, what do you do with that? Who's in our third year? Um, I can't see all the people. Say that again. You have a low grade and a what? So she's 29 years old and you have a low grade PAP. What low grade SIL, what's your recommendation? Barring that she's not like, she had a low grade last year and you cobbled her then and now you don't have to this year. Like this is her first low grade SIL path. What's her HPV? Um, so good, address that. So let's say it's positive or negative. Tell me which to do with either. We're not done. If it's negative, you can repeat everything in a year. If it's positive, hope. Culp? Don't know, Culp. Yep, excellent, thank you. And then um, high grade SIL, Culpo. If unmanaged, what percentage of women with high grade SIL will progress to cancer? I know they have like a 60% chance of having a high grade lesion on colposcopy biopsy. Um, So that's excellent. 20% um, of women with high grade, if unmanaged, will it says they will go on to get cancer. So you can do a colposcopy or a diagnostic excision procedure. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So you might get atypical glandular cells on a pap test. About three out of a thousand women will have a pap that shows that. Does anyone know about what the risk of cancer is with that? Isn't it pretty high? Theory. And what I saw was like three to 17% chance. And so what kind of testing would you do for that? EMB. 
So you want to do your colposcopy with an ECC because you're worried about something on the inside, right? The glandular cells are either the inner cervix or possibly the inner uterus. So for sure, colposcopy with the ECC and then an endometrial biopsy. One could argue you could do that for everyone that has this or for sure you want to do it for people that are at increased risk for endometrial cancer. And can we run through those risks again real quick? Obese, over 35, um, OCP use, no lip, early menarche, PCOS, and ovulatory stage. So I don't think the OCP use, but I mean, that does increase your risk for cervical cancer, but probably not um, uterine. But the um, chronic anovulation, also a family history that's suggestive of what would you want to do an endometrial biopsy. You know, Lynch syndrome? Um, um, colon mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cancers that would suggest a family history of Lynch syndrome or um, that's also called... Uh, Hereditary non-polyposis carcinom... <laughs> yep, colorectal cancer, yep. And so there are other... Um, cancers in families that can can cause that or increase your risk for that, like colon cancer at a young age, family history of endometrial cancer. About 3% um, of colon or endometrial cancers are caused by Lynch syndrome. So it's like, just keep the whole, I don't think you could ever go wrong by doing the endometrial biopsy for um, atypical glandular cells. Okay, next. How do we do a colposcopy? Someone who's been to Copo Clinic, can you just tell me what to do? I can. Okay. You're uh, like on a roll, Brittany. <laughs> I just, this is, happened last week, so I'm just prepared this week. So, okay. So you obviously consent them, tell them about the procedure, tell them about the percent chances, uh, percent chances of like what their biopsy might show based on what their pap smear is. And then once they're in the room, put them in the stirrups, put the speculum in, visualize the cervix, focus the microscope, um, and then you look at it with the green filter, clean it off with saline first. Look at it with the green filter to visualize any abnormal vessels. And then you would put the um, vinegar on, look for any acetyl white changes, um, which can take like 30 seconds. And then um, after that, if you, well, first you wanna make sure you can visualize the whole transformation zone. Um, if not, then you can use like an endocervical speculum. Um, and then if you're not satisfied with your vinegar and acetyl white changes, you can do Lugol's. Um, and then from that point, you would decide if you want to take biopsies or not. If you do not see the entire transformation zone, then you would do an ECC because it's not like a satisfactory cult. Um, and then if you did a biopsy, obviously you'd tell them first, do the biopsy, and then put on some mon cells. Um, and then that's it. Okay, you touched on some really good points there. The... Um, so the, so when the acetic acid was originally used by Hinselman, who's a Kobo, I don't know, he like, that was his life's work. Um, he used it to clear away the um, mucus. So it enhances the image, but then it also causes the, um, something to happen to the cells. So what, what happens to the cells that makes the acetic acid helpful for you? Does anyone know? Yuri? Um, so it dehydrates the cells. So the abnormal um, cells, their cytoplasm gets dehydrated. And so they have a greater nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. And so you see more of the nuclear um, part that turns white. So the bigger nucleus turns up white it causes so the more um more differentiated the cells are the more cohesive they are and um so there's less aceto white changes the less differentiated the cells the acetic acid causes um like swelling of the atypical 
endometrial, or excuse me, the atypical endothelium, epithelium, sorry. So the more like, the more white, the thicker the change that implies more atypia. So, um, and then Brittany, you also talked about what is, um, what makes a colposcopy satisfactory. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the, um, the Lugol solution. What, so that test, when you put that on, that's called the Schiller test. And what is Lugol solution? Yeah, so it's iodine based and basically the glycogen um, is responsible, the glycogen in the cells. Um, and so with like cancerous cells, they have higher cell turnover. So they use up their glycogen. So they have less glycogen. So they take up less of the iodine. Um, so they appear less dark on colposcopy with the Lugol solution. So they're more of like a yellow, whereas like with out abnormal cells, it's like a brown with the Lugols. Yeah. And there's other cells that don't, that was an excellent explanation. Um, there are other cells that don't take up Lugols very well either. Do you know, like the endocervical cells don't. So, so like when you see, I'm gonna find this slide. So here, this is that same um, ectopy slide I showed before. So this is it just looking, this is with acetic acid and this is with the iodine. And these cells just don't have the, as much glycogen either. So there are some cell types that are less, they, they have less glycogen. And so, so this, I don't know if you would ever see a picture of this, but this is like the glycogen containing epithelium. Okay. So then, um, and then also just know too that like in postmenopausal women, the um, vagina and cervix will stain more of a yellow color also. Okay. So things to see at colposcopy. So this is the transformation zone. The white here, this is the um, squamous metaplasia over these glandular openings. So you can, you can sort of just see it happening here. Um, the leukoplakia, like we talked about, the white plaque, the perikeratosis, you, that'll often be a little bit more delicate where the hyperkeratosis can be thicker. If you remember this slide from before, this was condyloma. And then this one underneath it, um, and I only know this because this is what the Atlas said, there's CIN3. And I don't, I mean, how do you tell the difference between these? Biopsy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, which I think is a huge point to be made about colposcopy now, the, um, you know, the, the recommendations, the new guidelines have kind of backed off on testing in certain circumstances. Like if someone has had a um, low grade change last year and, a, and your colposcopy didn't show CIN2 or greater, then this year they have a, another low grade change. They're um, maybe saying don't copo them, but it's predicated on the fact that last year's colposcopy at last year's colposcopy, you did everything you could to exclude CIN2. So um, looking at like, if you read through those um, evidence-based colposcopic guidelines, like more, more biopsies, basically, the two to four biopsies per colposcopy, except maybe during pregnancy, of course, but the, and ECCs, if there's any question kind of thing. So yeah, how do you tell the difference? Biopsy it, that's right. Okay, so the hyperkeratosis is like this thicker plaque and that parakeratosis is usually thinner. And you might pick up those on a pap test too. The cells might show that. Okay, our old friend punctation. Um, so that can be like kind of fine like this or it can be more papillary, a little more coarse. And you can see um, histologically that it really looks like what it looks like grossly with the um, blood vessels here and the, the pap papillary papillus, papillus, um, protruding up and see how it's such a sharp 
like this is normal and this is not normal, how the demarcation is very sharp between the normal and abnormal. And then with mosaicism, um, it can be, you know, it's got that cobblestone appearance there and it can be um, pretty dense. You can see the vasculature. This is mosaicism next to the mother of pearl condyloma. So they look different. And histologically, same thing, sharp border. And it looks like you can see the cobblestones there. So um, we talked about this a little bit before, but what are the, what are the mosaicism and punctation? Like what does it represent? Vessels. Yeah, and, and the, the vessels are the brighter spots, like the outline of the cobblestones or the, the dots with the punctation. And then it's the um, thicker epithelium there that's representing or by the, represented by the aceto white. So the um, finer is probably less significant disease than the coarser. So on um, colposcopy, I thought this was interesting. If you see leukoplakia, the risk of dysplasia is 7%. If you see mosaicism or punctation, the risk is 19%. If you see all three of those, the risk of having neoplasia is 31%. And the chance of having neoplasia with acetal-white epithelium is 17%. And again, almost all colposcopically significant lesions will have the sharp borders. Reactive changes have a more diffuse border. The sharp border is because the cells had to transform to look like that, whereas the diffuse border, they can just um, like get inflamed and change on their own. They haven't like become a different cell type, basically. So um, the natural history of, um, of neoplasia, so you have your normal and then the mild where you have the atypical cells starting at the basement and then they move closer to the surface and they get with the bigger nuclei as they get more severe. So, so why we don't um, get too bent out of shape about CIN1 is because it frequently will spontaneously regress. Um, what is the chance for CIN2 to spontaneously regress? What percentage will do that? 40%. Yes. And how, what percent will go on to CIN3 of CIN2s? 5%. A little bit higher, 22%. What percent will go on to cancer? 5%. Yes. And then CIN3, what, um, so, so for CIN2, that involved, the atypia involves two thirds of the distance here. For CIN3, it's over two thirds. Um, for CIN3, how many will spontaneously regress? 30%? Yeah. And 12 to 40 become cancer. Um, so it used to be, I don't know how many years ago, but a while ago, where these three were separated out, one, two, and three, people cared about it. And then maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, people, they were saying that two and three act pretty similarly, so they should just be called all high grade and treated the same way. And then now they're separated out again. Um, also, the reason that they clumped them together is sometimes hard to differentiate pathologically or histologically between these two. Um, but now they care about it again, um, presumably because the um, treatment recommendations can be different, especially for people who want to um, like have fertility concerns where you might um, excise something and maybe cause a problem by excising. So, um, no, this is actually taking longer than I thought it would. Um, what time are we going till? 1030? Do we know, I think? Probably because then we usually get like a break, right? For 10 minutes and then Dixon's at 1040. Okay. Do you want to go through um, like 
cryotherapy leap, or do you want to do prologue question? I think Dixon's doing prologue. Oops. Yeah, so cryotherapy. We, we never do it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So we never do it um, because we're doing leaps instead. But you can do it, and um, and there might be an instance where you're doing like if you're in Guatemala or someplace where you do visual in inspection with acetic acid, and then you freeze any aceto white basically, um, which is kind of a an uncomfortable position to be in if you're used to like doing biopsies and making sure before you treat. But they found that that, um, that protocol did um, uh, decrease the risk of death from cervical cancer in low resource areas. They studied India, an area in India particularly by um, more than 30%. So it's not an invalid approach if that's your only um, choice, but a lot of times, um, you know, we're just doing excisional procedures instead. So, but there are criteria for ablative procedures. Cryotherapy is one ablative procedure. CO2 laser ablation is the other. CO2 laser ablation, I don't, it, that's been pretty much replaced by LEAP, but, um, and then our excisional options are LEAP, cold knife cone, and laser cone. All of these methods have a first treatment success rate of over 90% if the patients are chosen properly. Um, what do you suppose the criteria for ablative therapy are? Low grade lesion. You can actually do it for CIN3. Um, Exclude cancer. Out, would you? I don't know. But, um, so, but it's a satisfactory colposcopy with an, um, so adequate visualization of the squamal columnar junction. The biopsy confirms that there's um, dysplasia, that it's not just an abnormal pap test, and there's no endocervical involvement. And the specific contraindications would be that the lesion is bigger than the probe, because um, you have to, the probe has to cover it. So does, has anyone done cryotherapy? Okay, so that's a, you get a um, tank with it, which I think has the nitrous oxide in it. It's a, and there's different kinds of probes that you can use and you find the one that would most likely like cover the lesion. And you hold it up against the cervix and then there's a freeze cycle and you have to, um, freeze it until the ice ball extends um, five millimeters beyond the edge of the probe. And then it, that usually takes about three minutes to get to that. And then you turn off the freeze and you let it thaw for five minutes, remove the probe and then reapply it and refreeze. Um, and so it's like a three minute freeze, five minute thaw, three minute freeze. And then these people will have um, like a watery vaginal discharge for about three um, weeks afterwards. You want to recommend pelvic rest. That discharge in my mind is all those dead cells coming off. I think that's what it is. And then has anyone done CO2 laser ablation? Yes. So do you want to talk about um, what kind of safety measures you put in place for that and what your... Um, what your, how you did it? So we actually did it on that patient that you and I saw together that had like zero cervix left. And so that's why we did it because she had like, I think she had CIN too, persistent CIN regardless. And so we did it at Luke's and you have to make sure that you, all, everybody has specific eye protection on um, in the operating room for the laser. And again, there's like different, um, sizes for the actual um, like part that goes over the cord, if that makes any sense. And it, same thing with like when we use our um, leaps and stuff, you want to make sure that everything's coated in the vagina so that you're not getting other areas of the vagina. And then you just kind of paint it over top of um, the entire cervix is what we did. Did you use paper drapes or cloth drapes? Do you remember? Um, I mean, I think we use paper. Because there's, because you're, you're supposed to worry about fire hazard. Yeah. Um, 
so what else did you do for so everything was moist like we put moist towels all over around like the vagina area so that we didn't like you know accidentally caught it was a fire out like laterally but i don't remember anything else other than the eyewear and the moist towels did you put a fox swab in her rectum or in her anus so that's i don't know if that's still we always did that that's why i call those rectal swabs but to wet it so that she doesn't <laughs> pass gas during the case and cause an explosion. Oh. So I don't know if that's, um, is Liz still on? Is that? Yeah, I've never done that. <laughs> oh, maybe that's an old timey thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, protective eyewear, blackened speculum, wet towels, cloth drapes. So. Um, Do we use okay. a cloth drape, Dixon? Nope. I didn't think Favorite so. Favorite drapes, wet towels. Wet towels. Yeah, Dr. Dixon, you and I did it on um, on the vulva. Correct. Yeah, I think it's. We didn't use those wet. Like we just used the wet towels, but yeah, it was wet just towels. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, um, when would you do a cone biopsy versus a leap? I think in particular, if you're concerned about adeno because of the skip lesions, you can typically get more into the um, cervical canal a little bit deeper than you can always with leaps. So um, with if you have glandular abnormalities, and um, Dr. Dixon would be able to speak better to this than I can, but the, I think are the margins more important, like not to have a thermal artifact on the margin, but also what I was reading is it said they wanted like a, at least a 10 millimeter length of the cone as opposed to like a leap with a top of the hat to have one intact specimen. Um, okay, and then what factors are more are most associated with persistent disease after a leap? Like let's say for CIN3. What's, what's the um, positive margins, number of leaps she's had? How long she's had it? So in the size of the lesion, lesion, endocervical gland involvement, positive margins. But now there is one very interesting thing, um, I think, in talking about um, margin status. So if you have a positive margin after a leap for CIN2 or greater, the chance of persistent CIN2 it is, or the absolute risk of persistent CIN2 with a positive margin is 17%. And the, which isn't high, I don't think. But the post-treatment HPV testing is the most accurate predictor of treatment outcome. It's a better predictor than the margin status is. And it has a 91% ability um, for HPV-based testing to pre predict persistent CIN2 regardless of what the margin showed. And one thing I wanted to point out with the new recommendations that are different than the 2012 recommendations is in 12, when you did a leap for CIN2 or three, the recommended follow-up was co-testing in 12 and 24 months. And they have backed that up to HPV-based testing in six months, and then yearly after that for three consecutive tests. And then every three-year evaluation provided it's normal for 25 years. So they were more specific about the endpoint on that increased surveillance, and it's longer um, than it was before. Um, OK. And then I think too, let me just, um, I, mm -hmm. so as Brittany was talking about before, the risk of like what you do now and what you do later is dependent on how high is the risk of getting CIN3 in five years, which is what they're using as an end, a surrogate endpoint to cervical cancer. And that's the whole basis for the new recommendations. This this more detailed model that incorporates history as well as your current findings. And then um, uh, trying to minimize 
um, I guess, unnecessary interventions too. But it talks about the, per it's all based on the percentage. Um, the, so, you know, just kind of take a look at that, maybe read that, the more detailed guiding principles. And then I just, I know you guys know I'm full of biases and I just want to share one with you about um, the immediate excision for the um, high grade SIL on a PAP. So the new guidelines really talk about an increased role for that as opposed to doing colposcopy first. And what they cite is that they're one out of 1.7 women will undergo a LEAP procedure for every case of CIN3 diagnosed at diagnostic excisional procedure. And according to the ASCCP, that is a low rate of overtreatment. Another way to look at that same statistic is that 30% of women who undergo immediate excision versus a colposcopy with biopsy first will have an unnecessary leap. And so that may not be like a huge deal for someone who's done having their kids, um, but it might be a huge deal for someone who isn't. And so, um, you know, consider that in your shared decision making too. Obviously, better to treat if they're going to be lost to follow up or high risk for that or something. But um, do you know? Do consider. I mean, Kelly is that patient that we saw together. She had had a couple leaps, and now she still has a problem. And you know, it's hard to know what to do with those people too once they've been scarred. So, not that it's not inappropriate treatment. I'm not saying that. It's just. Um, Anyways, just want to share that. So do you guys have any questions? I know we have zero seconds left. I'm really surprised it took this long. I'm sorry about that. Can you send us the questions that you picked and the um, answers and stuff? Yes. I'll tell you one of them's wrong now because they changed the recommendations. Um, but it's the, I can, can, if I just tell you the numbers of the question, questions yeah. in the prologue, would that be good enough? Do you think? Yeah, that'd be good enough. Okay. Um, I will, um, maybe I'll try to send you this. I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks guys. Have a good rest of your day. You Thank too. you, Dr. Oliver. Thank you.